Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in for the Commander's Core Studio. Welcome to the show. So on today's episode, I'm going to be taking you through my brand new, totally legal, 166 card Commander deck. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well Mitch, you must be mistaken because you can't have a Commander deck over 100 cards. Now that's true and I completely agree with you, but there's kind of a way around that. Let's talk about how this deck came about first. You see, my Golos deck is one of my personal favorite Commander decks. It's an incredibly powerful and efficient deck, even on a budget. The problem is that there are times where it can be a bit too powerful. It was built in a synergistic way to activate Golos an absurd amount of times while controlling the board completely. It also basically had the goal of winning in the same way each time. So I thought, why not change it up and make it more enjoyable for everyone? So I dismantled a ton of the deck. With some minor adjustments, I kept lands, ramp, mana fixing, some counter spells, and a few wraths. So with all those categories, there are 60 set cards that I do not change in this deck. The other 40 cards for the deck are going to be determined completely at random each game. I have a completely separate pile of 106 cards that are marked on an inner sleeve with a sharpie. That way I can easily identify them and take them out and shuffle up again between games. So I shuffle that pile of 106 cards and I take the top 40 and I add it into the deck. I have no idea what those 40 cards are and each game is going to be completely different. Now, why was 106 the number that was chosen? Well, no real reason. I basically just went through my collection, made some trades, and made a list of other budget options to get. Essentially, I just wanted a number that was high enough that would make each game very different. Now, I promise you talk a little bit about Golos and talk about why this commander specifically works for this concept. Golos is a 3-5 scout that costs 5, and when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a land card, put that card in the battlefield, tap, then shuffle your library. And by paying 2 in Wooburg, you exile the top 3 cards of your library, and then you can play them this turn without paying their mana cost. So essentially, you want to activate Golos and cast big things off the top. That goal stays the same between my old deck and this new one. The main difference, though, is that that old deck was built in a very synergistic way. Now with this new build, it's kind of anti-synergy in a way, because we're getting random cards in each time, and we have no idea what we're going to be casting. And I also put another restriction on myself that can really lead to some interesting situations and some fun gameplay. No matter what spells I hit off the top of my library with Golos, I am forced to cast them, even if it's detrimental to me. So with this, I am truly spinning the wheel. I might be in a great position, but then I hit a Wrath, and oh no, all my stuff's gone as well. And I've actually even put some spells that are really detrimental to me actually in this deck, so we'll talk about those here in a bit. Now there's a ton of huge, exciting, fun, and interesting spells in Magic, and I'm expecting that this list will continue to grow. But for now, let's go through that list of 106 so you can see what random cards I might be getting in a game. Let's just start with some big creatures, some heavy hitters like Sarah Avatar and Soul of Eternity. Both have power and toughness equal to our life total, so yeah, they can hit pretty hard. On top of that, we can get Sarah Avatar back if it dies, and Soul of Eternity, we can Encore it and smack everyone for a ton. Next up, we've got Desolation Twin, which is a 10-10, and it brings a 10-10 friend. And speaking of a 10-10, we've got Colossus of Acroas, which has Defender and Indestructible, but if we pay 10, we can make it a 20-20 with Trample, and it doesn't have Defender. And we've got some more heavy hitters that are also hard to deal with, with Tromocratus, Inkwell Leviathan, and Dargar's Reignited. Tromocratus is an 8-8 that has Hexproof unless it's attacking or blocking, and it can't be blocked unless all creatures defending players controls block it. Inkwell Leviathan is a 7-11 with Shroud, Island Walk, and Trample, so yeah, this thing hits hard. And Dargar's is a 7-7 Flying Trample Haste Dragon, and if it dies, we essentially get it back in three turns. And then we've got some Keyword Soup creatures with Sphinx of the Steel Wind and Zatulpal Primal Dawn. The Sphinx has Flying, First Strike, Vigilance, Lifelink, Protect from Red, and from Green. And Zatulpa has Flying, Double Strike, Vigilance, Trample, and Indestructible. So yeah, Keyword Soup. And I even included some heavy hitters from my childhood that were personal favorites of mine with Phantom Nishaba and Silvas Rogue Elemental. Phantom Nishaba is a 7-7 with a Trample that can be hard to kill. And my old buddy Silvas is an 8-5 with a Trample that can regenerate just for a green. 
We've also got some heavy hitters that can help our entire team though with Enray's Forerunners and Silver Seraph. When Enray's comes into play, it gives our creatures plus two plus two, Vigilance, and Trample until end of turn. And then Silver Seraph gives other creatures we control plus two plus two as long as we've got Threshold. We've also got some creatures that can help us out in combat as well, like Necropolis Regent and Victory's Herald. Necropolis Regent says, whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, put that many plus plus one counters on it. And when Victory's Herald attacks, it gives our attacking creatures flying and lifelink until end of turn. So yeah, these all can be some great ways to make our team even deadlier. But then we've got some ways to grow our team with things like Mirror Battlesphere, Symbiotic Worm, and Overseer of the Damned. Mirror Battlesphere brings four little Mirror Buddies into play with it. When Symbiotic Worm dies, we're going to get seven 1-1 one -one green insect creature tokens. And then Overseer of the Damned is going to make us zombies when our opponent's creatures die. We can also make more tokens with things like Rampaging Baylos, Silverwing Squadron, and Parhelion too. Baylos gives us a 4-4 whenever we put a land into play. Squadron makes us a 2-2 with Vigilance for each opponent we have when it attacks. And when we attack with Barhelion 2, it's going to give us two 4-4 white angel creature tokens with flying and vigilance that are attacking. Some consistent creature creators, though, come with Thieving Amalgam and Wolverine Riders. Thieving Amalgam says at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, you manifest the top card of that player's library. And then Wolverine Riders gives us a 1-1 green elf warrior creature token each upkeep. Now, obviously, I'm simplifying some of these cards and what they do and skipping on some things, but we've got a lot of cards to get through, so let's keep going. We're also going to be using some of the creatures from the Force Cycle, like Verdant Force. It's going to give us a 1-1 Sampling Creature Token at the beginning of each upkeep. And then we've also got Celestial Force, Tidal Force, and Magmatic Force. They also have upkeep triggers with Celestials being you gain 3 life, Tidal Forces being tap or untap target permanent, and Magmatic Force being 3 damage to any target. Again, keep in mind that each of these trigger on every upkeep, including our opponents. We've also got some big creatures that can help with removal as well, like Terrasodon and Angel Serenity. When Terrasodon comes into play, we blow up three non-creatures and make three elephants for whatever we blew up. And then Angel Serenity can exile three creatures until she leaves. Next up, we've got some damage dealers with Pestilence Demon, Chaos Maw, and Thorn Mammoth. Pestilence Demon has Pay of Black, it deals one damage to each creature and each player. When Chaos Maw comes into play, it deals three damage to each other creature. And then Thor Mammoth is going to fight when it comes into play or when any other creature we control comes into play. We've also got some demons that demand tribute like Malfagor and Demon of Loathing. When Malfagor comes into play, we can discard our entire hand, but then each opponent sacrifices a creature for each card we discard this way. And then Demon of Loathing simply makes a player sacrifice one creature when it hits them. We've also got some ways to mess with combat though with Pursued Whale, Geode Rager, and Pramacon. Pursued Whale essentially gives all of our opponents a Captain Ahab, which forces their creatures to attack. And then Geode Rager goads at opponent's creatures when a land comes into play under our control. Pramicon can really mess with things though because when it enters the battlefield we choose left or right and then each player can only attack in that direction. This can be a great way to protect ourselves and to mess with other players as well. Speaking of protection, we're also going to be running things like Thrix the Sudden Storm, Sphinx the Final Ward, and Donglay Regent. Thrix makes it so that our spells with converted mana cost 5 or greater, cost 1 less to cast, and they can't be countered. And then Sphinx the Final Ward can't be countered and it says instant sorcery spells you control can't be countered by spells or abilities. Donglay Regent's going to make us the Monarch, and if we are the Monarch, permits we control of Hexproof. And with our giant army, it's going to be pretty hard for our opponents to get through and take that Monarch back. But now let's talk about some powerful triggers though, like Sepulchral Primordial, Molten Primordial, and Luminate Primordial. Each has an ETB that gets better with each opponent that we have. Sepulchral is going to get us one creature from each of their graveyards into play under our control. And then Molten will threaten one creature for each opponent. Luminate exiles one creature for each opponent and gains them some life. Some other powerful effects come from Scholar of the Lost Trove, Guy Ruda, and Artisan of Kozilek. When Scholar enters the battlefield, we can cast target Instant Sorcerer or Artifact card from our graveyard without paying its mana cost. When Guy Ruda ETBs, he's going to make everyone mill four, then we get a creature card with an even converted mana cost from among those cards onto the battlefield under our control. And when we cast Artisan of Kozilek, we can reanimate one creature from our graveyard. Oh yeah, and it's also a 10-9 with Annihilator too. Next up, we've got an attack trigger on Certlin Elementalist. Whenever it attacks, we can cast an instant or sorcery spell from our hand without paying its mana cost. And then whenever Rakshasa Debaser attacks, we put a creature from defending player's graveyard onto the battlefield under our control. And on top of that, it's got Encore, so we can do this for each opponent when we're bringing it back. Finally, Moldcraft Monstrosity has a great death trigger because when it dies, we return two target creature cards at random from our graveyard to the battlefield. But we're not quite done with ETB effects just yet, so let's tackle Arbiter of Null Ridge. When it enters the battlefield, each player's life total becomes the highest life total among all players. So this might benefit us, but it also might hurt us. Which again just adds to the random fun of this deck. Effects that will definitely help us though are Resolute Archangel, Verdant Sun's Avatar, and Torgar Famine Incarnate. Resolute Archangel is going to bring our health back to 40 if we're lower than it. And then Verdant Sun's Avatar gains us life when it comes into play and when other creatures come into play under our control as well. And when Torgar comes into play, one player's life total becomes 20. 
We've also just got some really good value creatures as well, like Kirkesh, Emoti, and Brenolin. Kirkesh can essentially double up Golos' activation by just paying a red. And then Emoti not only has Cascade, but gives Cascade to all of our spells with converted mana cost 6 or greater. So now all of our big spells are going to get us even more spells. And then Brenolin also helps us out by making our big spells bounce non-land permanents. And like Emoti, we've also got some other Cascade creatures like Enigma Sphinx and Sakashima's Protégé. And when Enigma Sphinx is put into our graveyard from the battlefield, we put it into our library third from the top. So we can Cascade multiple times with this. And then Sakashima's Protégé is basically a clone for any permanent that enters the battlefield this turn. And finally, we've also got some creatures that can help us change up the dynamics of the game, like Tesa Envoy of Ghosts and Elder Scale Worm. Tesa has, whenever a creature deals combat damage to us, we destroy that creature and put a 1-1 white and black spirit creature token with flying onto the battlefield. And then Elder Scale Worm has, as long as you have 7 or more life, damage that reduces your life total to less than 7 reduces it to 7 instead. But then Deceiver Form can really change things up though by basically turning all of our creatures into something else. Basically, at the beginning of combat on our turn, we flip the top card of our library. If it's a creature, all of our other creatures become a copy of that creature. And then Attempts at All Seeing can really throw up on itself. Whenever it deals damage to an opponent, we can reveal our hand, and if cards with at least 6 different converted mana costs are revealed this way, that player loses the game. And many of the times with this deck, since we're going to be casting things off the top, we'll have a full hand, so who knows what converted mana costs are in there. But now let's tackle some non-creature spells, though these spells do make creatures like Storm Herd, Deploy to the Front, and Crush of Worms. Storm Herd's gonna make us X-1-1 White Pegasus creature tokens with flying, where X is our life total. And then Deploy to the Front's gonna make us a soldier for each creature on the battlefield. Crush of Worms only makes us three creatures, well, six if we flashed it back, but those are gonna be six six worms. And then there's Clone Legion, which for each creature target player controls, we get a copy of that creature. So we can copy our own or an opponent's if they're in a better spot than us. But we can also just either take or get things back though with things like Boneyard Parlay, Fate of Return, and Profound Journey. Boneyard Parlay is basically a factor friction but for creatures in graveyards. And then Fate of Return just gets us back one creature, but it's gonna have Indestructible. Next up there's Fated Journey which has Rebound and it's gonna bring us back target permanent card from our graveyard to the battlefield. We can also steal a couple things at once though, just directly from play with Blatant Thievery. For each opponent we gain control of target permanent that player controls. And then Mob Roll can basically temporarily give us all the big creatures or all the small ones. We can also flip the script though and mess with our own army though with things like Mass Polymorph and Synthetic Destiny. Mass Polymorph makes us exile all creatures we control and reveal cards in the top of our library until we reveal that many creature cards, then all those creatures come into play. Synthetic Destiny essentially does the exact same thing, but it's kind of delayed because it's at our end step. Again, these can be effects that can actually hurt me, but again, where's the fun in not casting them? And speaking of an effect that can hurt me, there's Undo Inversion, which, yeah, just blows up everything. And then Necromantic Selection is going to destroy all creatures, but we get one of those creatures back. Most of the time, we're probably going to pick Golos, but you never know. And then Soulfire Eruption is a doozy, so let's just read the whole thing. Choose any number of target creatures, Planeswalkers, and or players. For each of them, exile the top card of your library. Then Soulfire Eruption deals damage equal to that card's converted mana cost to that permanent or player. You may play the exile cards until the end of your next turn. Basically, this can hit a lot of things for a lot and give us access to a ton of cards. A more guaranteed piece, though, of target removal comes with Violent Ultimatum, which is going to destroy three target permanents. And then, of course, there's Cruel Ultimatum, which is very cruel. It makes target opponent sacrifice a creature, discard three cards, and lose five life, and essentially, we get the exact reverse. And then Fracture Identity is going to be a nice card for some. It's going to exile target non-land permanent, then each player other than its controller creates a copy of it. Some cards that can really mess with people, though, are Head Games and Denying Wind. With head games, we essentially get rid of an opponent's hand and then tutor them up a new hand. And then Denying Win lets us exile 7 cards from one player's library. And with this one, sometimes the best target for this can actually be ourselves. But of course, we've got some spells that can help us cast even more spells like Brilliant Ultimatum, Genesis Ultimatum, and Emergent Ultimatum. Brilliant is basically a factor fiction that we cast. Genesis basically gets us some permanence off the top into play and the rest into our hand. And Emergent lets us cast 2 or 3 monocolor cards from our library. The biggest of these, though, might be Imanatu's Augury, which lets us cast a ton of things off the top 8 cards of our library. Next up, there's Genesis Storm, which gets us non land permanents off the top of our library for each time we've cast our commander. And then Mind's Desire gets us multiple things off the top of our library, depending on our storm count. We've also got some creature-specific ones like Summoning Trap, Vivian's Invocation, and See the Unwritten. Summoning Trap and Vivian's Invocation give us a creature off the top 7. See the Unwritten gets us one creature off the top 8, or two if we've got Ferocious. Next up, there's Spell Twine, which lets us cast one instant or sorcery from our graveyard and one from an opponent's. And then Reversal Fortune lets us cast an instant or sorcery from an opponent's hand. And finally, Unexpected Results lets us spin the wheel once or multiple times if we hit a land. 
Now let's talk about some spells that can be really fun though with taking control of other players' turns. Worst Fear says you control target player during that player's next turn, exile Worst Fears. So yeah, this can truly make the worst fears of a player come to life. And then there's Cruel Entertainment, which basically lets us swap two players' turns. So one player controls the other player's turn, and the other one controls that player's turn. So when you cast that, grab your popcorn and enjoy the show. We can also swap some life tolls though with Reverse the Saiyans and Profane Transfusion. Reverse the Saiyans lets us redistribute any number of players' life tolls. And Profane Transfusion swaps two players' life tolls, and we get a giant creature based on the difference. Next up, there's Revenge, which doubles our life total and makes an opponent lose half their life total. And then Archangel's Light can be a great way to gain us a ton of life and also help us not mill ourselves because it's going to gain us two life for each card in our graveyard, then we shuffle our graveyard into our library. Now, I have talked about a couple of cards that do have some downside when we hit them at the wrong time, but these cards that I'm going to be talking about now are almost always going to be a downside. Repay in Kind can be especially bad for us if we have a lot of life because it says each player's life toll becomes the lowest life toll among all players. Now this can also help us, but most of the time it's probably going to hurt us. And then Peer into the Abyss is an interesting one because it says target player draws cards equal to half the number of cards in their library and loses half their life round up each time. Now this can be played in a couple of different ways, but most of the time we're going to be targeting an opponent with this. They will be losing half their life, but they also get access to a ton of cards. And the final one though that is pretty much never good for me though is Allure of the Unknown. Basically, at the top six cards of my library, an opponent gets to cast one of them, and yeah, there's some heavy hitters in this deck. Last time I cast this spell, it got copied, so both Dan and Eddie got a choice out of the top six, and one of Eddie's cards that he got was Worst Fears, so yeah, I lost that game. But now let's move on to some enchantments that can help us out as well, like Axis of Mortality and Swarm Intelligence. Axis of Mortality says at the beginning of your upkeep, you may have two target players exchange life totals. So more life swap shenanigans are always a fun thing. And then Swarm Intelligence basically copies all of our instants and sorceries that we cast. Now this is almost always a good thing, except again when we copy Lord of the Unknown, and then we lose. And finally we've got Samurai Convergence and Collective Blessing. Samurai Convergence protects us from flyers and gives us a 5-5 worm at the end of the turn. And Collective Blessing is just a giant anthem giving all of our creatures plus 3 plus 3. So, as you can see, there are a ton of big and exciting things that I can randomly hit off the top and be surprised in a good way, or sometimes even in a bad way. Regardless, sometimes taking the synergy out of a deck can make it more fun for everyone, and adding fun restrictions of your own can make it more fun for you as well. Again, this is just my current list of 106 cards, and I'm always going to be looking to add to it with trades and finding other budget cards, and when new cards get printed too. So I'm definitely excited to see where this deck goes in the future. And with that, this show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again, and have a good one.